20 years, the strategic deterrent power of the United States has rested on a three-pronged arsenal of intercontinental ballistic missiles, submarine-launched ballistic missiles, and our heavy bomber force, commonly called the Triad. Throughout the lifetime of this strategic deterrent power, the Department of Defense has modernized the three elements to maintain their credibility. We have thus continually overcome the Soviets' attempts to thwart the effectiveness of this triad. For example, the range of our submarine-launched ballistic missiles, SLBMs, has been increased from the 1,500-mile Polaris to the 2,500-mile Poseidon, and now to the 4,000 nautical mile Trident One, currently being deployed in the fleet. Thus, the Trident missiles can be launched at a greater distance from the target, so that the Trident has 10 times as much ocean area in which to hide from Soviet detection. Similarly, when the Soviets perfected their high-altitude interception techniques against our B-52 bombers, our tactics were changed to low-level penetration of Soviet defenses. With new techniques and equipment, our bombers could penetrate under the Soviet radars and anti-aircraft missiles. When the Soviets developed look-down and shoot-down interception techniques, we developed and tested the cruise missile. Our B-52s will present the Soviet Union a mixed force of bombers and terrain-hugging cruise missiles. This mixed force would require the Soviet deployment of thousands of defensive systems instead of just hundreds. The third leg of our strategic nuclear triad is our land-based intercontinental ballistic missiles. Since the early 1960s, our Titan II and Minuteman ICBMs, buried in hardened vertical silos, have been the cornerstone of the triad. Their alert rate is high. They can be launched almost instantaneously and under positive command and control procedures. ICBMs are also highly reliable, reducing maintenance and operating costs. Most importantly, maintaining this ICBM force ensures that the Soviets cannot concentrate solely on defeating the other two legs of the triad. Today, this ICBM force consists of 54 Titan II missiles, a single warhead heavyweight ICBM, 450 Minuteman II single warhead ICBMs, and 550 Minuteman III's, a multiple independently targeted re-entry vehicle system with three warheads. Both the Titan and Minuteman weapons have been modernized and hardened. However, despite these efforts, our ICBMs located in fixed silos are becoming vulnerable to the increasing accuracy and numbers of Soviet missiles. This is the most serious problem facing our strategic forces today. Our intelligence capabilities and verification techniques have determined that the newest Soviet ICBMs, which they are now deploying, have a guidance accuracy and warhead yield combination that seriously threatens the survivability of our current ICBM force. By the early to mid-1980s, the Soviet Union will have deployed enough warheads to destroy 90% of our ICBM force with a preemptive first strike. During this critical period, our missile-carrying submarines at sea are expected to remain undetectable and ride out a first strike and be available for a retaliatory launch. Future Soviet anti-submarine detection capabilities are unknown. Therefore, we cannot simply assume that our SLBM force will remain undetectable forever. Our alert force of B-52s, given adequate warning, can be launched and escape destruction. However, a Soviet SLBM barrage attack might overcome this force on the ground. Additionally, while we have the capability to launch our ICBMs under attack, this option, a hair-trigger situation, does not provide crisis stability. This tactic requires highly accurate and reliable assessment of the attack against us and assumes that our warning systems have not been destroyed. We would therefore prefer not to depend on launch under attack, although it is an option we will maintain. Thus, it is imperative we maintain a survivable ICBM force to ensure that if any other triad components become vulnerable in the future, 
overall strategic deterrence will not be seriously eroded while we correct a problem. Development of the MX missile with its survivable basing mode will reduce ICBM vulnerability and maintain a strong, credible triad. The MX has been under advanced development for several years. The first flight test of the MX missile is scheduled for 1983 from Vandenberg Air Force Base, California, with the first 10 missiles operational in mid-1986. The MX basing mode is a multiple protective shelter system. The planned cluster deployment areas are located in the southwestern United States. This photograph of a typical valley has been retouched to simulate the locations of shelters and roads. The transporter vehicle carrying the missile and launcher would periodically move on unpaved roads from shelter to shelter. At one of the 23 shelters, the missile and its launcher would be installed. A mass simulator with identical weight and other properties would then replace the missile and launcher in the transporter. These simulators would have been installed in each shelter at the time of construction. At each remaining shelter, Installation procedures using the mass simulators would be carried out so that Soviet surveillance systems would not know which shelter actually contains the missile. Additionally, electromagnetic and other emissions would be simulated in each empty shelter and in the transporter. Normally, the MX missile would change shelters within its cluster only after a routine maintenance cycle, perhaps a few times per year. If compromise of missile location is suspected, the system could operate in two additional ways to maintain its survivability. First, all missiles could be relocated to other shelters in several hours. Should the national command authorities require MX to retaliate, the shelter door would open, the launcher would emerge, erect, and eject the missile. The first stage would ignite and MX would be on its way to its assigned targets. Many tests have been conducted in the evaluation of the various basing mode concepts. This 1.4 million pound transporter vehicle is now being used for roadability and maneuverability testing. Several different types of dirt and gravel roads have been constructed for the vehicle to operate on to determine cost and durability. Scale models of horizontal shelters were constructed and subjected to high explosive blasts simulating nuclear environments to gather design data. Large sheltered doors were constructed and tested in debris studies. This data is being applied to the current design. Missile ejection from a canister has been repeatedly demonstrated in a series of design feasibility tests and the concept of free flight ignition or cold launch has been demonstrated in the Polaris, Poseidon, Trident flight tests. Moreover, the MX system provides the flexibility to deter a high Soviet warhead buildup. We could counter such a Soviet buildup by increasing our shelters in pace with their warheads, or, in the extreme case, by adding a ballistic missile defense to MX if the Soviet actions warranted withdrawal from the existing anti-ballistic missile treaty. In this regard, we plan to construct the basic 4,600 shelters in such a way that an additional 2,000 shelters could be added within the original shelter deployment area. Furthermore, the Air Force and Army are working together to ensure that MX is designed to be compatible with the Army's low-altitude ballistic missile defense system. DOD planners believe such a Soviet force expansion against our shelters would not be attractive to the Soviet Union. 